Our scripture reading comes this morning from Psalm 123. Psalm 123, you can find it in your Pew Bibles, page 498. It's a fitting psalm for this Thanksgiving Sunday. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. As the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. Have mercy upon us, for we have had more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than its fill of the scorn of those who are at ease, of the contempt of the proud. For we have had more than enough of contempt. Let's pray together. Loving God for the promises and instruction and hope and prayer reflected on the pages of Scripture, we give thanks and we offer prayers for each of us as we hear the Scripture and take it to heart. And we give prayers for those that are stuck in traffic, wanting to be someplace other than they're not, where they are. Prayers for all. Amen. You've heard me quote Reverend Ken Sehested before. Ken is a longtime Baptist leader, former head of the Baptist Peace Fellowship of North America, uh, something of a visionary, a hymn writer, or primarily now is a writer living in Asheville, North Carolina. Ken is one of the uh, beautiful people of our Baptist tradition. And this morning, Ken has provided with us with Ten reasons not to give thanks. Why is it hard to say thanks? One, often just because we're not paying attention. Two, the barrage of demands on our time and energy creates tunnel vision, making it difficult to see anything that's not directly in front of our noses. Three, the world owes me. Why should I th say thanks for the things I deserve? Four, saying thanks means I will be in someone's debt. I'll have to return the favor later on. And I've already gone beyond my credit limit. Five, saying, thanks, saying thank you is a form of weakness, and there are many predators out there looking to exploit such weakness. Six, my mama taught me to say please and thank you, but she doesn't know how the world really works. Seven, to thank someone is to admit they are your equal. And if, you're, if you are equal, then I'm not special. Eight, if you're, if you're going to succeed in this life, you've got to have an edge. Saying thanks dulls the edge. Nine, saying thanks is admitting I'm not self-sufficient. I don't do dependency. 
only the strong survive. And 10, I work hard. I earned what I got. I'm the captain of my own ship, and I don't take on passengers. The list could go on. You could probably add your own. And one reason, or another reason, that it's hard sometimes to give things, <clears throat> difficult, almost wrenching, it's because we live in a world described by the psalmist. We live in a world where we have seen, felt, experienced, known, not just in the past tense, but on an ongoing basis, more than enough contempt. We've been the objects of contempt. We've expressed contempt. That contempt can be directed at us because of our race, because of our sexual orientation, because of our gender, because of our occupation, because of our faith. In the world of November 2023, even this Thanksgiving Sunday, we have had more than enough contempt. Sometimes it seems like it is the very soil of our lives. And in the midst of contempt, in this soil of contempt in which our lives are growing, one of the temptations is to narrow our focus harden our eyes, constrict our hearts, and lift up Ken Sehested's Ten Reasons for Not Giving Thanks. And this is unfortunate, if not sad, because in this world filled with contempt, we are much better served we are much better served by opening our hearts and softening our eyes and recognizing the contempt and recognizing the grief, but believing that sometimes, maybe frequently, grief and gratitude travel together. One of the first points I would like to make this morning is that if contempt describes the soil in which our lives are growing, the soil from which our souls are being grown, gratitude, the simple act of gratitude is like a plant in that soil a plant that can transform the soil. Look, I'm, I've never been a farmer, and I, maybe there's some farmers in my background, I'm not sure, but those that study agriculture tell us that sometimes when the soil has produced the same crop year after year, after year, I'm glad Charlene is nodding because when I get an amen from North Dakota and I'm talking about farming, you know I'm on the right track. And one way to replenish the soil when it's been grown out from growing corn year after year after year is to grow some alfalfa. Grow something else. And so if contempt describes the soil of our lives, if we grow a plant of gratitude and carefully nurture it, it produces beauty, it produces grace, it can transform the very soil in which our lives are growing. I, please, I do not mean to in any way understate the 
difficulty sometimes of giving thanks. And I also want to recognize that it's probably not helpful at all for a preacher to stand before a congregation and say, you ingrates, you need to be more grateful. Right? That's, that's not exactly a helpful message, and I hope that's not what you're hearing. But I do want to lift up the practice of gratitude. In the title of a book, a 2018 book by Diana Butler Bass, Grateful, the subversive practice of giving thanks. The subversive practice of giving thanks. I love that title. Giving thanks is not surrender. It is contempt. It's not contempt you win. It is subversive. It is a will to reverse the contempt. In the book, author Bass says some very important things about Thanksgiving. Goes on for some almost 300 pages. But let, let me lift up a few words, a few quotes. First from Christy Nelson. Like other forms of practice, gratefulness makes us more resilient and flexible and also offers a way to frame and learn from everything that unfolds in our lives. So gratitude frames our lives. From my researcher, Robert Emmons, gratitude drives out toxic emotions of resentment, anger, envy, and may be associated with better long-term emotional and physical health in transplant recipients. Medical research here. In the same vein, another medical researcher, Paul Mills, it seems a more grateful heart is indeed a more healthy heart. And not heart in the metaphoric sense, but heart in beating the blood sense. Just a physical heart health. Mills continues, The link between gratitude and heart is so pronounced, one research team identified gratefulness as a, quote, strength of the heart. Another writer, David Stendhal Rest. If you're grateful, you're not fearful. And if you're not fearful, you're not violent. And if you're grateful, you act out of a sense of enough and not a sense of scarcity, and you're willing to share. If you are grateful, you are enjoying the differences between people, and you are respectful to everybody, and that changes the power pyramid under which we live. Gratitude is subversive. It can change the nature of the world in which we live and grow and have our being. Now, in her, in her book, author Bass says that gratitude is both an emotion, an emotion and an ethic. It's, it's both a, a feeling and a way of being. Gratitude as emotion. She tells the story of one hot Nashville summer in the dog days of summer, losing her dog, Rembrandt. Rembrandt got a hole out of a hole in the back fence. <clears throat> and she was immediately both panic-stricken and guilt-stricken. It was, why hadn't she filled that hole? Rembrandt was gone one day. She put up signs. Two days, started calling vets. Three days, traversing the neighborhood. Four days, she gets a call from a neighbor 
five blocks away. Rembrandt is here. She drives to the neighbor's house, barely stops the car. She may have even left it running and runs to the door. And there's a matted, tangled, thistle-filled hair, fur dog, Rembrandt. And Rembrandt! Rembrandt! Oh, it's so good to see you. That is descriptive of the emotion of gratitude. There's also the ethic of gratitude, the way of being, of bringing it into our life together. Let me, thought I had my Kindle all queued up here. On November 22nd, this is a story about the ethic of gratitude. On November 22nd, 2015, Pastor Jason Mitchell stood in the pulpit at Aldersgate United Methodist Church in Alexandria, Virginia, and preached a sermon on gratitude. It was right before Thanksgiving, and it was the church's stewardship season. Sound familiar? a time when the congregations are urged to consider gifts and generosity, the ethic of gratitude. In the autumn, a gratitude sermon was nothing out of the ordinary. But this was not an ordinary day. Jason, a 40-something father with young children, was preaching for the first time in nearly a year since being dosed, diagnosed, and treated for a rare and incurable form of cancer. He was better. The cancer was, quote, controlled. But as the congregation knew, he would have to do chemo every two months for the rest of his life. He stood in the pulpit, barely out of treatment, to preach a Thanksgiving sermon for his community. He began, you all have done so much for us, praising them for their ethic. You've fed us and prayed for us and with us. You've helped us with my medical bills, and you've sat with me in the hospital. You were there to catch me when I missed out, and when I passed out in the chemo room, and you didn't bat an eye when I puked in your car. But he said as much, he, but he said as much as he appreciated it, he actually hated all that help. I've always been awful at receiving gifts, he admitted. I hate feeling like I'm in another's debt. I was a guy who kept score, which means it didn't, I didn't mind you being in my debt. I just didn't want to be in yours. But he learned something about gratitude. It's not just about repayment of debts, it's about relationships, this ethic of gratitude. Through his cancer, Jason discovered that courage and hope could not be summoned magically. Rather, strength and healing came through community. He spoke of the church's greatest gift to his family in crisis. We can endure all things because you've been with us. You are with us more so than all the stuff you've done for us. You've been with us. Gratitude is an ethic. It's a way of being. It can be individual me, and it is very frequently communal or social we. To use some Latin terms, we often think of gratitude as quid pro quo. You do something for me, I'll do something for you. Author Bass says, oh, it's so much more than quid pro quo. It's pro bono. It's for the good. The good of us. Oh. Now, practice is an emotion. Gratitude is an emotion. It's an ethic. It, 
it is, in Arthur Bass's terms, a practice. It's something we work at. It's something we can get better at. She lifts up different practices of gratitude. One of them, if you read the LABC updates I shared with you this week, it's a, another Latin term, the examine, E-X-A-M-E-N. It's a Latin word from English, we get the word examination. And examine is an end of the day practice. It's got five points. Become aware of God's presence. Review the day with gratitude. Pay attention to your emotions. Choose one feature of the day and pray from it. Look toward tomorrow. The practice of examine, of, of reviewing our lives, reviewing our days. What gratitude comes forward, what prayer comes from that gratitude, and having lived this day, we begin to pray, prepare for the next. Examine can take a very simple form. I see a lot of folks, if Facebook is to believe, practicing it. Three things I'm grateful for today. And just a list. I'm working on it. Yesterday my list was rain, soccer tournaments, and a dry house to come home to. Gratitude is woven, woven into the life and ministry of Jesus. Gratitude and thanksgiving are not words in the Lord's Prayer that we offer every Sunday, but, but they're there. Gratitude for the work of God that is being done on earth as it is in heaven. Gratitude for daily bread. Gratitude for being forgiven and the opportunity to forgive. The week before he was crucified, a woman anointed Jesus with oil. And the religious, the spiritual, the sanctified, the holy among his crowd, Judas said, oh, what a waste. That oil, that oil could have been sold and given to the poor. And Jesus said, how about just giving thanks? How about just giving thanks? And remember, your complaint will probably be forgotten. Her act of care will long be remembered. Give thanks. The Gospel of Luke. Gospel of Luke, there's this account of Jesus cleansing ten lepers. And that's the, that's the Greek word cleansing. I invite you if you would like. I, I want to do a little word study here. Uh, page 852. Page 852 in your pew Bibles. Jesus cleanses ten lepers. Down at the bottom, verse 11. It's, it's, the geography is important here. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, but he's in the region between Samaria and Galilee. He's, he's not exactly on home turf here. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called, called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. 
When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Now hold on to that verb. They were, they were made clean. And, and, and leprosy was, yes, a disease, but it was also a status. It was a religious status. It, was, it could be some skin infection that just rendered them ritually unpure, unable to go into the temple, unable to join together in worship. Yes, it could be a threat to their health, but it was just as much a, a religious standing. And so, on the wording, on their way they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. Thanked him. He was a Samaritan. He was an outsider. He was... Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up, go on your way, your faith has made you well, whole. Greek word is actually save. Your Jesus cleansed the lepers, but it's the thanksgiving that saved this one. And Jesus is saying something very important about gratitude. Yeah, I, I, can, I can make these ten ritually pure. But it's the gratitude, it's the gratitude that will save them. I think Jesus is saying something very important about the act of giving thanks. All ten were cleansed. It's the one who gave thanks that was healed, saved made whole. We live in a world where there is enough contempt. We felt it. We may be feeling it. God forbid we might even be expressing it. But in this world where there is more than enough contempt, gratitude, gratitude stands as a practice that can subvert that order, change that soil. Let me use another analogy. If contempt is where we are and salvation for ourselves and the world is where we want to go and there's a great canyon between the two how do we bridge that canyon build a bridge of gratitude Had enough contempt? Time for the subversive practice of giving thanks. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Amen.